So today's subject is uh, McIntyre's paper titled Can Medicine Dispense with a Theological Perspective on Human Nature? And if you've read, then his answer in this paper is actually yes. So I would like to I, I would like first to give you some context to this paper. It was first published in 1977, and it's a kind of a milestone in McIntyre's intellectual development, or it's at least interesting from the per perspective of that development. Uh, it's an important step in his way to writing After Virtue, which was published uh, if I'm correct, four years later, 1981. And it's interesting to see how this paper relates to After Virtue and how it relates to what McIntyre wrote after that book. And it see what th claims he rejects afterwards, what claims he keeps and what claims he is going back and forth about. Uh, what's about which he cannot really decide in his uh, career. Secondly, an interesting uh, context to this paper is McIntyre's other uh, nine papers on medical ethics. At this time, at the end of the 70s, he wrote altogether 10 papers on the topic, including this one. And uh, some of them serve an important prelude to after virtue. For example, how virtues become vices, medicine and society. That paper features some of the key passages uh, already that become the beginning of the main part of After Virtue. And there are other uh, interesting papers in this series, uh, for example, to toward, uh, toward a, a theory of medical fallibility, which, is, which might be McIntyre's only co-written paper, co-authored paper, it was co-authored with uh, Samuel Gorowitz, and uh, another one is, for example, what has ethics to learn from medical ethics, and it kind of summarizes the, the insights that McIntyre gained from uh, writing and uh, thinking about medical, medical ethics that become uh, important in After Virtue, for example. A third context is uh, McIntyre's debate with Paul Ramsey, who is not to be confused with Ian Ramsey or F.P. Ramsey. Paul Ramsey was a Christian ethicist and he was defending the theological perspective in the rejoinder to this paper by McIntyre. And McIntyre wrote a quite harsh response to that uh, rejoinder titled Rejoinder to a Rejoinder, surprisingly. And afterwards, like a year, a year later or something like that, he wrote a very, very favorable, favorable review of Ramsey's, uh, one of Ramsey's books, saying that it is uh, the most important text in the area of medical ethics, at least in modern times. So these are, are at least the three important contexts to this debate, and I'm going to talk about all of them. The structure is going to be the following. First, I'm going to be talking about the obligations which are present in, Mac in medicine and McIntyre's uh, inter interpretation of these obligations. I'm going to talk about then about the teleological and uh, deontological accounts of these obligations, then about Kant's moral philosophy and theology. Uh, fourthly, about how McIntyre is dispensing with theology and Finally, about how he is saving to ideology in ethics. So first about medicine. You might even ask the, ask the following, why, why, why he's writing about medicine? Why is it important for him? Because after a while, if you read the paper, the whole topic seems to be a little bit arbitrary. And for, the first reason might be that uh, there was at the time uh, a debate about medicine and theology and uh, moral theology in particular. So McIntyre might be uh, addressing that uh, topic here. He, he might be contributing to that debate in this paper. Secondly, as McIntyre writes in another paper, uh, it seems that he's considering um, medicine as a tradition, which and also as a practice, 
which if you have read his uh, After Virtue, it's quite, uh, are quite important notions to him in ethics because he uh, uh, thinks that traditions and practices are inculcating virtue, are bearers of value. And it, I, would, I would say at least that in, at least in my understanding, uh, traditions and practices are kind of tests for him uh, to kind of test what could be what could be counted as virtues and what could not. Uh, in that other paper, he writes that medical the medical profession has had to safeguard and to transmit its values in a variety of very different social contexts. So it has uh, values that were transmitted from the ancient times, actually. And uh, the, what the medical profession was committed to were uh, values that it preserved through changing social and moral environments. And these values uh, committed to, to, to the preservation of life and health. And uh, these uh, features of this uh, profession uh, hold it to together as a kind of practice. Um, and as I said, it, it, had to it, it had to preserve its values through changing social environments. And the roots of medicine, of the medical practice are quite interesting from McIntyre's perspective because he says that uh, in, in this paper that I'm quoting here, in uh, How Virtues Become Vices, that uh, for most of its history, medicine has been uh, carried on in societies where human life was uh, immensely fragile and vulnerable. So the technical and the technical means to save lives was very limited. So the, the, what became the most important in these contexts was to save lives, to save human lives. And that's what's uh, embodied in the different version, versions of the Hippocratic Oath, McIntyre says. Uh, and I've looked into some versions of the Hippocratic Oath, and it seems that during those uh, changing social context, even the Hippocratic Oath has changed itself. I thought it's, this, it's just like the same, like in Hippocrates' time, but it's, it's different. And, uh, but all of them have kind of a profession or, or kind of a creed that commits doctors to the avoidance of harm and saving human lives. Uh, the earliest remaining version says that I will do no harm or in injustice to patients. And a very common present version of the Hippocratic Oath says that it's kind of the first obligation of doctors not to do harm. Uh, so McIntyre summarizes the values of medicine or uh, the values of the medical practice uh, in this paper that I'm presenting about today the following way. First of all, he says that we have to discount kind of uh, the, the disagreements which are present in debates on uh, euthanasia or abortion or other such uh, sensitive topics. Because if we are able to see the past those kinds of disagreements, then uh, unified, picture emerges that there is agreement about in medicine. And it's that there, there is an obligation to which is unconditional and absolute and categorical in a sense. If you read the paper, you might remember that McIntyre says that Kant's notion of categorical imperative is kind of misguiding. But if we are saying that a categorical imperative means that the imperative is not dependent on your will or your on your particular volitions or desires, then we might still say that these kind of obligations are categorical. 
and what it, it what it is an obligation to do. It's an obligation to save human lives, save the lives of the patients, which are supposed to be kind of sacred. Uh, and doctors are to treat human lives as uncon with unconditional regard and concern. And in How Virtues Become Vices, in that paper, McIntyre says that the, the preservation of the human life is an overriding goal for doctors. However, this kind of causes some problems or even moral troubles for today's society, because now we are able to save those lives which involve much suffering and uh, hopelessly crippled states. And uh, he says, uh, decaying old people. So it might be a problem that we are saving lives that are not worth saving. Um, these this what I've just said might be McIntyre's own view, or at least that's how it seems in that paper that I've quoted, that these kind of lives full of suffering and uh, disease uh, might be better not to be saved. But it, it's obvious for me that uh, in a later book, Dependent Rational Animals, he completely rejects that kind of view, and he says that even, so to say, crippled people are worth saving. But the main point is not that, is not the question whether these uh, people are, uh, what, what McIntyre thought about this in the paper that I quoted. The main question is that this kind of unconditional uh, obligation to save human lives might be questioned these principles are contestable and are in fact contested. So one might question in a moral argument that this is really an unconditional obligation and whether human lives are really sacred or not. And McIntyre cites in this paper, the case of German doctors and I, uh, that they easily uh, abandoned their commitment in the Hippocratic Oath when they were uh, joining euthanasia, unvol involuntary euthanasia programs or joined the Nazi concentration camps. And I just can't avoid but talk about this particular figure that he mentions, Nietzsche, who seems to be a medical doctor at or a psy psy psychiatrician at the time. And I, for me, it's just uh, striking and really symbolic that that it, it wasn't just the philosopher Nietzsche uh, in a mental hospital, but there was also a Nietzsche uh, a few de decades later working in a mental hospital with questionable ethics. And the, so the question is, if these uh, values of medicine are contested, then how could we justify them? How could we justify the unconditional obligation to preserve the life of the patients, the sacredness of human life. There are various uh, competing accounts in this area. Uh, for, and what, how, as I said, McIntyre seems to be uh, putting medicine on the side after a while in, in this paper. That's why, why it seems kind of arbitrary that in the framing of the paper, he talks about medicine. For he quickly says after a short, after a brief uh, part of the paper that this kind of requi requirement, the unconditional requirement is of course central to all of morality in any kind of obligations, this uh, unconditionality is there. And he goes on to, to use a quite trivial and banal uh, example, the student's obligation not to cheat in an examination. And secondly, he, he uses the example of the soldiers to accept the soldiers' uh, obligation to accept death. So he's already talking, by, talking about huge sacrifices that are 
uh, demanded by morality and also about quite trivial uh, sacrifices and quite trivial obligations that are demanded by morality. However, even if he puts a medicine on the side after a while, the case of the medical profession might still be important. And it seems to be because it, it, its uh, obligations are kind of paradigmatic here and are more obvious than, the, than, for example, the student's obligation not to cheat. Are these uh, obligations are more obviously unconditional and absolute. And uh, the medical profession has uh, conserved them in a more pure form than my, maybe other professions. McIntyre says that there are two justifying accounts that try to justify why these obligations are unconditional. The first kind is teleological and the second kind is deontological. Or those at least, or these are at least the labels that I would use for them. The first one is represented in McIntyre's paper mostly by Aristotle and uh, John Stuart Mill. And McIntyre says that it, this account comes with its problems because it distorts and misrepresents the unconditional requirement. And the other kind, the deontological account, is represented here by Kant and Pritchard. And the McIntyre says that it also has a huge problem because it renders these kind of uh, demands unintelligible. How is that so? I'm going to talk about that now. For, first, about the teleological accounts. McIntyre says that it has certain features that I would rather call tendencies in teleological think, thinking. First of all, it, teleological accounts of morality uh, tend to say or tend to claim that the moral obligations serve some ends. We could say that this is the definition of uh, the, the teleological accounts. For example, uh, morality serves the end or telos of man. And this is more like a tendency rather than a definition. Mm, I mean the following claim that by breaking unconditional uh, requirements, you will be frustrated or impoverished yourself. You are going to be less than you could be by uh, uh, obeying those demands, and you are going to be less than perfect if you uh, break those kind of unconditional obligations. Now, McIntyre says that this kind of account has two, two problems. First of all, it uh, trivializes, uh, I'd say, the unconditional obligations of morality, because it kind of suggests that you you fail to enrich your life if you're not obeying those uh, kind of obligations. But the issue here is not really of an achieved personality. Morality shouldn't just be about that, or it shouldn't be about that, period. And uh, McIntyre says that this kind of error suggests that moral, moral failure is like educational failure. Like if I learn to, if I fail to learn Italian, then I'm going to be less rich of a personality. I'm going, I'm not going to be able to read Dante in the original and uh, that's going to impoverish my life. But that's kind of trivial compared to moral failures and moral the moral evil, which is deflated, I'd say, about this kind of account. Because uh, teleological accounts put things uh, on a kind of scale. And evil, both in the Aristotelian account and in the, in the utilitarian account of Mill, becomes kind of imperfect or worse than the best. And it loses its... Uh, it's a characteristic and positive evil uh, nature. So McIntyre says that this kind of uh, evil uh, that is uh, breaking these unconditional obligations of morality is not just about not being good enough. It, it, it's not being good and it's also being positively evil. So 
being not good is not just a dep deprivation, it's an inversion of the moral order. For example, what happened in Nazi Germany is not just not good enough, it's completely evil. And secondly, the, de the deontological accounts, it again has kind of a tendencies according to McIntyre. It's according to the deontological accounts that there is there is a distinctive moral moral oath which is not comparable to uh, other kind of obligations like prudential obligations, for example, or the kind of aesthetic obligation to read Dante in the original, for example. Uh, but Kant, uh, as McIntyre doesn't quote this, but uh, we know that Kant said that these kind of obligations are facts of reason. And Richard says, as McIntyre refers to him, that we all know this kind of feeling and it, we all feel this it's a kind of uh, distinctiveness. And uh, Richard's intuis, intuitionism implies that this feeling, this kind, this kind of obligation cannot really be explicated. It cannot really be explained. And Kant says that moral principles are not based on human nature. And this is what leads to the problem of deontological ethics, because it seems to obscure morality. McIntyre uses his uh, uh, example of taboo, which he famously transmits to after virtue and he already used in another book of his uh, titled against the self images of the age he says that take taboo uh, not breaking taboos in certain kind of tribal cultures is also an absolute and inexplicable obligation so if you compare taboo with the with the obligations of deontological ethics you cannot really tell the difference, and thus ob moral obligations become indistinguishable from irrational superstition. If you cannot really give an, uh, an explication or an explanation of moral obligations, then you are lost. You cannot really tell the difference between superstition and uh, morality, or genuine morality. So we are facing a dilemma here. We either choose teleology and thus make, thus distort and misrepresent uh, moral obligations, or choose deontology and we thus obscure uh, moral obligations. But McIntyre says at this point that Kant himself saw that there is a problem here and uh, he was seeking a way out. That's why I'm going to be talking about Kant next, and that's why. McIntyre also turns to Kant in the next section of the paper. So it's quite a surprise for those who read After Virtue, for example, because McIntyre in that seminal book of his is totally unfair to Kant. He's very critical and he doesn't really give uh, uh, a fair account of Kantian ethics. He is he is, talks about it very briefly and uh, and uh, in a very in a really simplified way, which he actually makes up for in a much later book in the second volume of his selected essays. But here in this paper that I'm talking about is four years before. Uh, after virtue, and is he is already giving a much more favorable and uh, more complex account of uh, uh, Kantian ethics. He says that he wants to focus on papers and uh, books of Kant that are usually not treated with the same attention. They usually do not get the same kind of attention. So Kant's argument is something like this. Basically, it says that uh, absolute obligation, the obligations of morality, commits us to believe in freedom, God, and immortality. These are the famous postulates from Kant's philosophy. The first premise of Kant is something like this. Practical reason requires pursuing the summum bonum, 
And the summum bonum is kind of a, a mixture or an add, adding up moral perfection and uh, happiness. Thirdly, um, Kant says that practical reason cannot really demand the impossible. This, I would say, is the same as his famous uh, um, claim that ought implies can. Next, Kant would say that the summum bonum is impossible without freedom, God, and immortality. If, if there is no God, if there is no immortality, if there is no freedom, then we are not capable of the kind of happiness that we seek, and we are not capable of the moral perfection that we seek in the summum bonum, and that is required by practical reason. So the, the conclusion of this argument that God, immortality, and freedom has to exist according to Kant. Uh, so what, what he says about this kind of moral prog progress, it, it's very important, at least according to McIntyre, who says that this is the central uh, concept in the ethics of Kant. Uh, this moral progress is towards moral perfection or the summum bonum. And, and uh, a very important element here is the radical evil in human nature. Because Kant says that this radical evil is constituted by us deliberately preferring immoral or amoral maxims rather than the moral maxim, rather than the categorical imp uh, imperative. Mm. McIntyre says that this kind of uh, claim of Kant on the radical evil in human nature is empirical because we know, know it only by uh, uh, seeing that we are that we tend to prefer immoral or amoral maxims and that others do that too. And he says that evil isn't evil isn't extraordinary. And he supports his claim by the famous Milgram experiments, which we might be we might want to talk about in the QA because that's kind of uh, interesting or, or questionable for me, that example. But anyway, uh, this kind of radical evil lends space to moral progress because we start out as being evil and uh, practical reason demands us to progress toward the toward moral per perfection and uh, toward the summum bonum. And uh, the example of, uh, of uh, the Milgram experiments and the other kind of uh, uh, examples that McIntyre uses points us to the points us to why certain social structures are needed for morality. For example, he says that wars or scientific experiments create social contexts that make us more uh, prone to doing evil or becoming evil. Uh, this is a central theme to McIntyre. He has a great paper titled Social Structures and Their Threats to Moral Agency, where he discusses this. Uh, and you can also think of uh, situationism, which uh, says that in certain situations, everyone becomes evil. But at, even, even if one doesn't believe that, we could say that there are certain social situations which in which most people have a tendency to do some evil acts. And that's why we need to avoid social contexts and societies that uh, feature too much of those kind of uh, situations and uh, structures. And this is going to become uh, important later in the paper when he talks about individualism. So what's the link between the unconditional requirements of morality and uh, the Kantian teleology? It's this, that there is kind of a quest 
which is a journey toward a goal. And uh, we might interpret either our individual lives or the, or the life of the human race or the history of the human race or, as this kind of a quest toward a goal. And this goal might even be infinitely remote as Kant, I think would have said, but still there is a kind of goal in front of us. And the moral action, the fulfilling of the moral obligation is, a, is one step in the way towards achieving that goal. And this is the kind of uh, history or kind of quest that even lends your life its significance, according to Kant and uh, apparently McIntyre. And this is it, it is quite interesting for me, at least, to compare the so-called provisional conclusion in After Virtue, where McIntyre introduces also the notion of this quest. And this is where he arrives at this uh, provisional conclusion that according to which uh, the good life for man is the life spent in the seeking for the good life for man. And uh, this might reveal what other virtues and uh, values we have to inculcate to be able to seek after the good life for man. So just like according to Kant in this account provided by McIntyre, McIntyre himself thinks that human life is a quest and it's even if the goal is remote, this is what lends significance and uh, moral obligations to our lives. I would turn to the topic of sacrifice here because McIntyre, it, it's, it's an important theme in uh, communitarian ethics and communitarian political philosophy and also in McIntyre, who himself doesn't regard him as himself as a, as a communitarian, but still the connection is there. So according to them, political theories need to explain uh, sacrifice, for example, the sacrifice of soldiers that is demanded by politics from time to time. And uh, I think this is McIntyre's best shot at explaining that kind of demand, which is present in this paper, which we have uh, read for today. He says that only if I am prepared to sacrifice my life can achieve the goal. Only if I place my own physical survival lower on the scale of values than other goods can myself be perfected. So all, we can only achieve that kind of uh, goal. We can only complete the quest if we are willing to risk our lives. So uh, against Aristotle, he says here that uh, there, is a tele there might be a teleology in ethics, but it still might frustrate you. You might, it might still demand things from you that you, you don't like or you don't uh, appreciate or, or that hurt you. And uh, still those kind of uh, goals that you are to achieve give meaning even to those kind of uh, sacrifices. So this is the way the picture here that I've summarized so far is the way that Kant married teleology and deontology and he seems to be, have been able to make, to create an account that doesn't trivialize morality, doesn't deflate evil, and it is still intelligible. It, it created a kind of framework that makes this kind of uh, uh, unconditional obligations intelligible and unlike taboo. But he also married to teleology and deontology theology. So, McIntyre is worried about this kind of polygamy, I guess. Uh, let's turn now to, the, to theology. And McIntyre presents us with a dilemma. First, he writes that once it is seen that the choice is, is between God and Pritchard, God may appear the less daunting prospect, which means that if you have to choose between Kant's, theo the, uh, sorry, Kant's theology, and between uh, intuitionism, which doesn't explain unconditional requirements in morality, then you should go with theology, 
But theology, according to him, has its own problems. It doesn't work for several reasons. First of all, it seems arbitrary to believe to unbelievers. Uh, here he treats Karl Barth as the greatest of modern theology theologians, which he kind of uh, regrets later when he becomes a Catholic uh, after writing after virtue. But here, uh, Christianity and religion are treated as uh, faiths that are not that are inexplicable, that are that are incapable of being explained. You cannot offer a faith, uh, an explanation of faith. You have to believe first. You have to have faith first, and you you might be understand later on. But first uh, comes faith. And according to him, you cannot really convince anyone with, with that kind of approach. So again, this kind of theology, this kind of uh, approach to religion makes it, makes it inseparable from superstition, just like taboo, it becomes indistinguishable. I mean, religion becomes indistinguishable from uh, uh, irrational superstitions. And another kind of problem is the indeterminacy of uh, moral theology. He brings this problem up in uh, the, the rejoinder to Paul Ramsey. Uh, he asks, well, how do we derive from theology any norms detailed enough to guide us in medical ethics? He says that all the things that are present, for example, in the Bible are problems of the pre-modern world and the injunctions present there are not precise enough to guide us in contemporary issues because those issues didn't arise at the time. And he puts other criticisms to uh, religion and to Paul Ramsey, who was def defending uh, this kind of uh, theological approach. He says that no matter what, you cannot really derive a, po uh, a moral conclusion from any kind of uh, theological premises about God. And also, even if you could, there are different uh, derivations. For example, there is the Catholic kind or the Calvinist kind, and those are kind of clashing. So uh, we don't know how to settle the debate between those kind of uh, derivations. And another interesting thing for me that he says in the rejoinder to Ramsey is an example. Take Nazi Germany, he says. In Nazi Germany, ethics was supposed to be seen as a subordinate to the spirit of the German nation or to the spirit of the Führer or the Lord of Germany. And uh, it seems that Paul Ramsey was suggesting that ethics is just like that in Catholicism, in, in Christianity, sorry, that uh, ethics is kind of subordinate to a Lord, which is not the Lord of Germany, but the Lord of heavens. And uh, we see here two rival communities of faith, each invoking the name of a different Lord. But how then could we uh, decide between the two, between these two faiths? And McIntyre says something that is uh, quite sympathetic to me, at least. He says that the central part of the answer of how we can distinguish between uh, uh, Nazi Germany, the requirements, uh, the political requirements there and the requirements of Christianity, Christianity itself, uh, is that Christianity passes a number of ethical tests that Nazism fails. So. Morality seems to be before theology, according to him, unlike according to Paul Ramsey, who said that theology comes first, then you can arrive at morality. McIntyre says that, no, 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 no. First, you have to have a morality, and then you might be able to test uh, theological claims. Uh, what he says in, in the paper, uh, that's not the rejoinder that I've talked uh, so far, but in the main paper that I'm uh, discussing, uh, 
is uh, that there seems to be another kind of dilemma that even if theology explains absolute morality for us, it still might be bogus. It, it might still be the case that both theology and morality uh, are bogus and we have to reject them together. And you might compare the case of taboo because there might be certain kind of background beliefs that explain and help to explicate what taboo means or what those people think about taboos who uphold them. But still, you have to reject taboo with those background beliefs. And religion and morality might be like that, according to McIntyre. So be, perhaps we should get rid both of teleology, uh, sorry, both of uh, theology and morality. So the question arises whether there is an alternative or we have to get rid of morality entirely. And here comes the part when McIntyre tries to save teleology. So just to summarize where we are, the question of the paper is whether morality can dispense with a theological perspective. And McIntyre wants to argue in this paper that yes, we can dispense with a theological or a religious perspective, but we have to retain a teleological perspective, uh, a telos, to be able to account for morality. And so far he was talking about Kant's uh, theology, because Kant is saying that morality presupposes theology and uh, teleology. Morality could be saved only by using theology and teleology together. But McIntyre wants to argue that we can do without religion, that we can do without te theology and just do with teleology and save morality still. But at this point, he reflects on two other kinds of problems that teleological ethics has to fail, uh, face and which might betray it. So these are two more Aristotelian errors. The third one, uh, uh, which is added to the previous two problems of uh, teleological ethic, uh, ethics, is uh, the banality of the end. And here's a funny one, I guess, by McIntyre. He says, according to uh, Aristotle, all those remarkable virtues are to be practiced all the judgment and prudence is to be exercised so that we may become upper middle class Athenian gentlemen devoted to metaphysical inquiry. So kind of a upper middle class naval gazing is all that uh, uh, morality leads up to, perhaps us to achieve. McIntyre says that this kind of banality is present in all kinds of characterizations of the final end of uh, teleological ethics. Even if you characterize heaven or some earthly ut utopia, they all become kind of banal after a point. And this is why he says that this end cannot be defined or characterized at all. And the other kind of problem, which I list here as the fourth one, is the discrediting of uh, sacrifice. Sacrifice, uh, because uh, Aristotle, kind of uh, discredits it. He seems to say that you need certain kind of luck to be morally perfect and to achieve the telos of morality. For example, untimely death frustrates the moral quest or frustrates happiness that's also required uh, for a kind of morality, for a kind of Aristotelian morality. So how could suffering and death how could sacrifice be dem demanded at all? Teleology in its Aristotelian version, in Aristotle's version, frustrates both frustrates itself in these kinds of ways. So McIntyre wants to overcome these problems. And he offers uh, one solution to each problem. Uh, first of all, he says that the true and for man is not a state of affairs. It, it cannot really be characterized in a positive way or as a state of affairs or described in a meaningful uh, description that is detailed, that is really detailed. 
It's just like in Christianity, he says, we are always on the way. But who is this speed that we are talking about? And th this leads us to the solution of the second problem, because we are to uh, focus on a larger moral history that might demand sacrifices from us. When we see that uh, this kind of sacrifice is required from us, then we see most clearly, according to McIntyre, that our life has a significance in the context of that larger history. So it, it's going to be history rather than our per personal satisfaction or happiness that can demand this kind of uh, sacrifice and where uh, the telos of teleological morality lies, according to him. Uh, we can compare here a later book, or rather a quite recent book by McIntyre, Ethics in the, Con Concept, uh, sorry, Ethics in the Conflicts of Modernity, uh, in which he says that the end, the, the final end, the final good of man is characterizable only negatively, that we can, no matter what kind of uh, goods that we have acquainted that we are acquainted with in our life, we still have to look further and see whether there might be a, a further good that is even superior to the goods that we have uh, learned so far. And we have to kind of transcend finite goods, finite goods, and we have to look at some kind of infinite goods that we are that we at in our, our earthly lives cannot really characterize and just note here that i've that looking at these passages in ethics and the conflicts of modernity i've just noticed that in that book he is still kind of uh, oscillating between whether this kind of uh, infinite good requires theology or not because at one point where this kind of infinite good comes up in the discussion, he says that, and this is the very end of the book itself, he says that here natural, uh, here the enquiries of ethics and here natural theology begins. But another, at another point of the book where he talks about the same thing, he says that, he asks, does one have to be a theist to understand one's life in these terms? And he answers, of course not. So he still seems to be undecided about that, even if he is now a Christian, a Catholic thinker, he seems to be on the verge, on, or, or he seems to be sitting on the fence with regard to this question of uh, whether theology is required by morality or not. Uh, so as I said before, uh, McIntyre says that this kind of sacrifice is only in, in, in that I was talking about is only intelligible within a larger history of a group or an institution. And he uses here a few examples, groups or institutions, or even the class of the revolutionary proletariat that might give significance to sacrifice and that might explain the unconditional a demand to sacrifice ourselves and to suffer. Uh, and this kind of uh, histories are embedded in, he says, more expanded narratives. There is a larger moral history of which all these histories are themselves parts, he says. Uh, and I'm just thinking whether this might be the history of the whole human race, or I'm, if not, I'm not sure what he is uh, thinking of. So. Immortality is no longer required by ethics. We might still account for the demands of ethics by looking at this more extended narrative and the history of uh, groups or the history of classes of humans or the human race itself. So we only need, rather than immortality, we need only a historic aftermath, uh, uh, which comes after our individual lives. And so he says, these are kind of some injunctions that he gives in this paper that uh, which first of for the first of one, which I've put as down with individual list social structures, because we have to focus on larger groups and on humanity. And uh, in, in our theoretical accounts, according to him, 
we have to marry ethics and politics, philosophy and history. And this is what he tries to accomplish in uh, After Virtue. He also talks about what narratives, what extended larger narratives might be eligible for accounting uh, morality. I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but he says that they need to be true. They need to have a genre, which might be questionable. So we might, you might want to return to this in the Q&A. And he also says that these kind of narratives has to have to acknowledge the tragic element in human life, which is quite interesting for me as reader of McIntyre, because in the second volume of his selected essays in the paper, Moral Dilemmas, he kind of uh, says that there are no genuine tragic dilemmas in life, in human life, in a certain, in a certain sense, at least. So the conclusion of the paper is this. Kant's thesis that teleology necessarily presupposes theology turns out to be incorrect. Hence, the incredibility of theology need not endanger belief in moral obligation. We might still save moral obligation with kind of teleology that doesn't presuppose theological or religious claims. And you, you, we can compare this with the, the aim of after virtue, because somewhere, and I'm not sure, it's not in after virtue, but somewhere he's, he's, McIntyre says that uh, the aim of after virtue was to retain the functional conception of man, the teleological conception of man, without the metaphysical baggage or without theological baggage, we might even say. And that's what this paper is also getting at. And later on, of course, after McIntyre becomes a convert and turns to Christianity, he doesn't want to get rid of the metaphysical baggage altogether, at least. But I think this paper that I've presented faces several difficulties that we might face, uh, that we might uh, put forward. Uh, first of all, we might ask whether we can justify sacrifice if we are treating human life as sacred. So if, if we think that the life of humans is sacred, then are we permitted to sacrifice our lives or not? And in a more general way, to put, the, to put this uh, critique in a more general way, we may ask whether the sacri sacredness of human life was justified at all in this paper, because he said that we shouldn't focus on the in individual life. We should focus on larger histories and larger groups. So I think, I think uh, whether he achieved this justification is quite questionable. Secondly, uh, we might ask whether the sacrifice of your own people could be demanded by this kind of account or not. So, for example, if, if you're a part of the revolutionary proletariat, could it be demanded that you sacrifice the, your whole group? Or if you're a part of, uh, I don't know, if, you, if you're a member in an institution and that, that institution, the, the history of that institution is what accounts for the ob moral obligations for you. Could you be demanded by morality to sacrifice the whole institution for the sake of larger history? You might say yes, but so it's only explainable from uh, the perspective of, the, of what he says about these particular histories of groups being embedded in the history of humanity. So I guess he wouldn't say that you can be demanded to sacrifice the humanity as a whole. Uh, another problem for him is that just like religion, uh, supporting your own people might demand uh, moral inversion. You might be demanded to do uh, apparently evil things for saving your own group or saving humanity. And if you read Machiavelli, this is quite clear that that from time to time if you want to save your country if you want to save uh, safety itself in your co country or within your group may, or maybe with uh, within humanity in general you have to be prepared to do 
uh, immoral things, to do evil and to become uh, vicious. Fourthly, my question is whether the history of Nazi Germany could uh, be eligible itself as a narrative that uh, explains uh, the moral demands. So you, whether uh, the history of Nazi Germany could be the one that justifies for you certain kind of moral demands, and if so, then these might turn out to be quite evil from our present perspective. McIntyre's answer might be here that, as he said, these uh, histories that account for moral demands have to be true. So maybe he would say here that it's because the Nazi narratives are false and are full of lies. Lie, lies. That's why they cannot really account for morality in a genuine way. My fifth problem is whether this kind of whole account still makes uh, morality banal or even trivial. My main question is question here is whether any kind of end of the history of humanity on this planet or in this life, in this uh, universe, could really explain morality. And it, because, uh, for example, probably the human race will not survive uh, galactic collisions or whatever, or the entropy that comes at the end of universe. So if that's so, if, if you are going to be extinguished either way, then why should you sacrifice yourself for that kind of end of uh, humanity? And there are two more uh, problems that seem to be even more interesting or more central than the previous ones, the, the smaller qualms that I've listed so far. Uh, first of all, Kant and McIntyre, or at least McIntyre's Kant, doesn't seem to be really clear, clear whether teleology requires absolute obligation or the other way around. Absolute obligation requires teleology. So I'm not sure which part explains what part, which part comes first, unconditional obligations or teleology. And uh, finally, my last one is uh, whether morality could be a test for teleology or vice versa. So it's, it's uh, really closely connected to my previous criticism. I'm not sure whether we should uh, first take this kind of teleology provided by a larger history of uh, a group and then check whether there could be certain or which unconditional demands could be demanded from us by morality or whether we, we should first start with a list of un, unconditional requirements by morality and then see what could justify them, which happens in this paper. Uh, so either way, it might turn out to be putting the card before the horse. And I'm not sure which part here is supposed to be the card and which part is the horse. And uh, thank you very much for your attention so far.